All right, so in this video, we're going to investigate the uh, structure and function of the spinal cord. Uh, the spinal cord is still part of the central nervous system, but it's enclosed in the vertebral column. And like the brain, it actually is derived from the neural tube. Now, <clears throat> the spinal cord technically begins at the foramen magnum, and it ends around L1 or L2 vertebra. So what's odd about the spinal cord is it doesn't go all the way down the, the spinal column. It actually ends around the first or second lumbar vertebrae. Now, the functions of the spinal cord are mostly to be involved with the transmission pathway for sensory and motor information, but it also serves as a major reflex center. So reflexes are initiated and completed at the spinal cord. So <clears throat> the spinal cord is fortunately protected by bone, the meninges, and cerebrospinal fluid that surround it. We actually have spinal dura mater that's only one layer thick because it's only the meningeal layer of dura. There's no periosteal layer of dura. And therefore, it does not attach to the vertebrae. The spinal cord actually kind of um, is uh, only anchored to its surrounding meninges, not anchored to the bone itself. Now, the epidural space is actually a nice little cushion of fat that you find around the spinal cord. And remember, epidural space was actually between the dura and the bone. And this is actually a now a fat-filled space, which helps to cushion the spinal cord, but serves as a nice place for networks of veins and blood vessels to uh, basically surround the spinal cord. Now, CSF fills the subarachnoid space, just like around the brain. And uh, the dura and arachnoid membranes extend be to the sacrum uh, beyond the end of the cord, and they form something called phylum terminale. Now, because the spinal cord ends around L1 or L2, this is a nice, safe place to perform lumbar puncture. So if you look at the length of the spinal cord here, we see that uh, it begins at foramen magnum here, uh, and it continues down the vertebral column where it ends around L1. So L1 is the first lumbar vertebra, and you can see beyond that, there is no spinal cord. Rather, what extends beyond this is something called cauda equina, which are actually the spinal nerves, like lumbar and sacral spinal nerves, that would continue down the vertebral column and then exit at different points to you know, go out to the body. Now the spinal cord has spinal nerves that extend off the side. We have eight cervical spinal nerves, 12 thoracic spinal nerves, five lumbar and five sacral spinal nerves. And there's also enlargements here. So we see that there's a cervical enlargement. And the reason why the spinal cord is larger here is that you need a little bit more matter in the spinal cord to have you know, basically more neurons that control your upper limbs. We also have a lumbar enlargement, which is actually going to be the neurons that are, are associated with your lower limbs or lower appendages. And uh, the thoracic portion of the spinal cord is actually pretty thin because there's really not that much to control within the thoracic region that involves your spinal cord. So it's, it can be a little thinner there. Now, if we look near the end of the spinal cord, you know, around L1, we find that, uh, you know, essentially you can't really see the, the spinal cord anymore here. And that's because uh, the spinal cord itself tapers to a point at something called conus medullaris, and it's disappeared way up here. So at the point of like L4 and L5 vertebrae, there is no spinal cord. This is a nice, safe place to perform lumbar puncture, where essentially you can take a needle, uh, force that in the uh, intervertebral space here, and uh, draw out a sample of cerebrospinal fluid more safely because now there's no spinal cord that you could potentially puncture. This is where you might want to do lumbar puncture or spinal tap in order to you know, get a sample of CSF uh, in a nice, safe manner. Now, the spinal cord, <clears throat> uh, its cross-sectional anatomy is typically how we study it in terms of talking about its function. And uh, cross-sectionally, we can see things like the ventral and dorsal fissures in sulci. We see that gray matter in the spinal cord is located deeper within its core and white matter is on the outside. And there's a central canal that runs the length of the cord this is filled with CSF, and it's actually the remnant of the neural tube. So if you look at a cross-section of the spinal cord here, within the vertebral canal, and this is a cervical vertebrae, you can see, for one, the spinal cord is actually pretty small. Um, you know, if you remember going back to bones and how small the cervical vertebrae were, were themselves, <clears throat> and even within that, how small the vertebral canal was, the spinal cord doesn't even occupy all that space, you know. In this example, it's about the width of your pinky finger here. And you can see the gray matter that's deeper to the spinal cord. And these form what we call the horns. And you have white matter that's more superficial. And these form what we call funiculi that are basically white matter tracts of sensory and motor information. 
we see the, the meninges that surround the spinal cord. <clears throat> so we still have pia, arachnoid, and dura mater. However, the dura mater around the spinal cord does not anchor to bone. Instead, it's actually uh, surrounded by the epidural fat, and uh, this helps to cushion the spinal cord uh, from the surrounding bone. However, the spinal cord is actually totally encased within the vertebral uh, column. Now, the gray matter of the spinal cord uh, kind of resembles a butterfly here. We have the dorsal, ventral, and lateral horns. If you remember, dorsal means backside, and, and ventral means belly side, and lateral is just lateral. So the dorsal horns are actually made of inner neurons that receive somatic and visceral sensory information. So when you think, when you think dorsal horn, think sensory input. And the ventral horns contain the inner neurons that are involved with somatic motor neurons. So when you think ventral horns, think motor output. And then the lateral horns contain motor neurons of the sympathetic nervous system. So again, these are motor output, but only for visceral motor. You know, when you think of like smooth muscle and cardiac muscle, uh, these are going to be controlled by the lateral horns. Now, <clears throat> the gray commissure is a nice little bridge of gray matter that connects the masses of gray matter on either side. And this encloses the central canal. We have the roots, so ventral and dorsal roots, which contain motor and sensory input, respectively. There's a dorsal root ganglia, which contains a cell body of primary sensory neurons. And then when these come together, they form a spinal nerve, which actually uh, exits the intervertebral foramen out towards the body. So if you look at a cross-section here, first of all, we can see our meninges. So you have dura, arachnoid, and pia. And uh, if you look at the cross-section of the spinal cord itself here, we can see those horns. So we see our dorsal horn over here, our ventral horn over here, and then lateral horn on the side. Now you mostly only find lateral horns in the thoracic region of the spinal cord and a little bit of the lumbar as well. Um, but this is because, you know, this is where the sympathetic neurons are located. You're not going to find lateral horns in the cervical or most of the lumbar region of the spinal cord. Now remember, dorsal horns are involved with sensory uh, neurons. So the dorsal horn here, you can first of all tell it's dorsal because it actually almost touches the end of the spinal cord. and it's on the same side as the dorsal root ganglia, which is this little collection of cells over here. So that's one way to identify the dorsal horn. Over here we have the lateral horn, and over here we have the ventral horn. You can tell this is ventral because it's opposite to the dorsal root ganglia side. So this is the ventral side, or belly side, or anterior side. Now uh, out here we see the roots. So these are the ventral roots, and essentially the ventral roots would contain axons from the motor neurons in your ventral horn. Those would, those would leave the spinal cord, and those axons would go out towards the spinal nerve. And then coming this way, we actually would have axons that would go uh, towards the dorsal root ganglia, where we have our um, unipolar primary sensory neurons that then send their axon out towards the, uh, the dorsal horn, where they synapse on secondary sensory neurons, which are interneurons back here that then could send information up towards the brain. Now in terms of the white matter in the spinal cord, we see our ventral funiculi, our dorsal funiculi, and lateral funiculi. And a funiculus is basically just a collection of, of uh, axons that either ascend or descend um, along the spinal cord. You can also call them fasciculi. And if you remember, a fasciculus or a fascicle was a collection of muscle cells, but we also have nerve fascicles here within the spinal cord. And in a, in a future video, we'll actually learn about what those nerve fascicles carry. But for now, think that this white matter is actually made of lots of white matter tracts. And so we talk about the, the ventral, I'm sorry, the dorsal, the ventral, and the lateral funiculi. Those contain very specific tracts that carry information. Now, the spinal nerve out here actually contains, both, contains and carries both sensory and motor information. And the reason why it contains and carries both sensory and motor is that it has axons from sensory neurons in the periphery going back towards the spinal cord. It also contains axons from the spinal cord that are going out towards skeletal muscle. So by the time that these get to the spinal nerve, this is actually both sensory and motor. Now that differs though because the ventral root is only motor and the dorsal root is only sensory. So the gray matter of the spinal cord also can be subdivided into somatic and visceral sensory and motor. So if you look at the gray matter of the spinal cord in, in this picture, we see that somatic sensory is located closer towards the tip of the dorsal horn, and visceral sensory neurons are located deeper in the dorsal horn. And then over here, we see the somatic motor neurons are located in the ventral horn, and then visceral motor neurons are located in the lateral horn.
And remember, somatic sensory was body sensory. So we're, we're talking about information from your skin, joints, muscle, fascia. And this is going to be sent to your primary motor cortex for conscious perception of, you know, uh, body sensations. Visceral sensory information comes from your guts, like your internal organs. And this is actually subconscious. And this is going to be sent to uh, the portions of your brain that are involved with regulating homeostasis. Visceral motor was autonomic motor, and we talked about how that goes to smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands, and uh, this is also uh, unconscious information. And then somatic motor uh, are basically the, the neurons that go to skeletal muscle, so this would carry conscious information. And the reason why we study it in this regard is that to know where the somatic and visceral sensory and motor neurons are located helps us understand, well, if someone gets damaged to a specific part of their spinal cord, you know, then you can expect to see deficits in either somatic sensory or somatic motor, depending on where that damage is located. Now, the white matter of the spinal cord runs in three directions. We have ascending, descending, and transverse. Ascending is where you have information that's going to higher centers. Now, because it's ascending towards the brain, we think of this as sensory input, and this is also going to be afferent information. Uh, descending is where you have information from your brain to lower cord levels, and this is typically going to be motor output, so this is going to be efferent information. And then transverse goes from side to side, and these are commissural fibers. And these can be involved with things like reflex or even decussation or crossing of information from one side to another. So what this shows are basically the white matter tracks we talked about earlier. So we said that you know for the, the center of the spinal cord, we had our gray matter, which contains different things like our you know, sensory neurons or motor neurons. And uh, out here in the white matter, remember we had the dorsal funiculi, the lateral funiculi, and the ventral funiculi. Well, within that, we actually have specific tracts. Now, in the next video, actually, we'll talk about the functions of these tracts. So back here in the dorsal funiculus, you get the white columns here, which contains fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus. Uh, in, the, in the lateral funiculi, we get the spinocerebellar tracts, as well as some of our spinothalamic tracts and uh, corticospinal and rubrospinal tracts. And then in the ventral funiculi, we get some of the other spinothalamic tracts, vestibulos tracts, and tectospinal tracts. And we'll talk about what these mean and what type of information they carry in the next video.